McDowell. Zach, take it away. And Tracy, are we? Um, okay, we are recording. I just want to make sure. I, uh, I just uh, was looking for the controls. Good morning, folks. Welcome. Welcome to those who, uh, who are joining us for their first class. We're excited to have you. Um, the El Dorado County Master Gardeners, um, Master Gardeners General are volunteers that, uh, that are county specific and, and um, help folks grow vegetables. And so that's what we hope uh, happens today. Um, I will note we in the prior class and perhaps in this one and, and based on the poll numbers, there are folks from other counties. The information that we'll talk about today is, is certainly relevant and what might be a little bit different is your timing. So if you're in warmer, warmer climes, you can, um, your seasons are extended and you can start things earlier and um, et cetera. So we'll talk a little bit about timing and, and just a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead. As Tracy mentioned, this will be uh, recorded and available to you. I've been a master gardener for a couple of years in my day job. I'm a faculty member at a community college. This is my garden. Uh, so I garden in Georgetown. For those uh, in the central Sierra, I garden in Georgetown up around 3,000 feet where it does snow, but not a lot. And um, it snows every year and it sticks around a little bit, but um, I'm otherwise in, in a similar Gardening situation, as many of you in the county, we have hot summers that are rather short. We have uh, distinct seasons, but not really brutal winters typically. And this is my garden this year from, uh, this would have been a couple of months ago. I garden both in the ground and in raised beds. So I currently have, uh, let's see, three raised beds in play here and uh, about 25 or so, maybe a little more row feet of, uh, in this case, tomatoes. That's what the uh, T-post and rebar there is how I trellis tomatoes. Um, so I just want to ask you, um, how does your garden grow? And so there's a poll up there. Um, is it your best year ever? Is it ugh, just like the rest of 2020 seems to be? Or is it uh, some things are growing, some things are struggling? Uh, so please just respond to that poll. I just like to get a sense of, of where people are, even though I pretty much, I've been doing this class in the summer and, and spring, and I pretty much know the answer, <laughs> um, which I think says something about gardening or at least gardening in this county or perhaps gardening in general, right? Gardening is ultimately an act of hope and an act of uh, uh, faith and an act of putting things in the ground and hoping in 30, 60, 90, 120 days, you'll be eating some of those things, at least vegetable gardening is, so. It's about 81% people have voted in what it looks like. Let's just get a few more answers there. So if you haven't voted, go ahead and do that and we'll close that poll. In three, two, one. So here's what it looks like. Um, and I could have told you this. Um, more or less people are, it's, a little bit balanced between having their best year ever and and ugh, and then some things are thriving and some things are struggling 66 percent so well over half of the folks that responded and that's very typical right um and it's especially typical if you are trying growing in a new area or trying something new a new plant or if you're in this case uh, starting a, a fall and winter garden you know there may be things that work really well for you there may be things that um, that struggle and I always recommend that you uh, document that stuff. Take pictures of your garden, write things down. We talked a little bit about garden planning and management in the prior session, but because um, you forget, like you forget which kind of uh, broccoli you planted. And so, so um, take good notes. My garden is just like many of yours. It's some things are great. Um, I had great, I had terrible tomatoes, even within species. Like uh, I had terrible tomatoes of a lot of kinds and couple of kinds that were just killing it. This is, uh, these are mini San Marzanos. Um, San Marzano is a, a, a tomato that's a sort of a plum type, but it's an uh, strange for, for plum type tomatoes, which are typically bush type, it's an indeterminate. And these are a mini uh, version. And they're, I get this much like every two days. That's a big um, food service kind of mixing thing. 
Um, and they're really tasty and delicious tomatoes. I had other tomatoes that just didn't go at all and had a bunch of pests and diseases. Um, this year, I had a really good crop of this, this plant, which is not maybe what you think it is, or maybe if you think it's blueberries, it's not that. Um, this is Aronia. Uh, so Aronia melanocarpa, I believe. Um, it's, a, it's a berry that is astringent. Um, so it's not for everyone. Um, it's made into sodas and jams and all sorts of things uh, in various places, native to the eastern part of North America and up into Canada. Grows pretty well here, and um, the berries are good. They have a kind of astringency, kind of a back of the mouth um, puckering effect. Not sour, but just so it's weird. It's hard to describe, but they they go really well, and in, in, they can be used as blueberries or in, in syrups and so forth. Um, I want to know, um, so just an overview of what, what's happening. Last week or two weeks ago, we did part one of this, this presentation, which talked about preparing a site and choosing plants and getting an, a real understanding of how multi-season gardening works, uh, especially if you haven't done it, it's kind of a new way to think about um, the calendar year. And today we're going to just dive into the, the things that we're planting um, now and into the um, I'm looking for my planting guide, and into the 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 next couple of couple of weeks, and uh, expecting to harvest, um, you know, into December, January, February, and into early spring. And finally, we'll close with some resources um, that will do to to solve problems and to to kind of get your arms around what what fall and winter uh, vegetable gardening looks like. And um, what we learn as master gardeners was we learn many of us or all of us have a thing that we love to do and we're sort of specialized in. So we have folks that are vegetable gardeners and we have folks that are into Japanese maples and roses and those kinds of things. And but what we what we learn in the master gardener training is how to get the answers, um, either drawing on expertise of other master gardeners or using a variety of resources available from uh, master gardener program. So we'll share some of those with you. And in my day job, I'm a faculty member, and so we talk in terms of outcomes in, in that. Um, and so here's what I hope happens. Uh, outcomes are what we hope you do after this experience, having been to this experience. And so I hope that you plant or expand a vegetable garden. I hope that uh, use uh, good planting, good strategies in terms of timing and soils and so forth to grow healthy and nutritious vegetables. Uh, we hope that you adopt IPM strategies. That's integrated pest management, and it basically is kind of using the least toxic uh, methods for um, controlling or dealing with pests and diseases. And, I, and finally, I hope that you, share, I, that you have surplus and that you share it uh, through uh, plant a row efforts, which we'll share for this county or through neighbors or uh, other things. So just to get a sense, if you could uh, answer for me, I have grown a fall winter garden before. And that, that me, might be yes, and it might be no, and it might be that you don't know because you are here to, to kind of learn, learn what that means. And so any of those are appropriate answers. Just give you a second to. Answer that question. So we're up at around 80%, so I'm going to, if you want to vote, get your vote real quick, and then we'll end the polling and get a sense of the room. All right, we've hit that threshold. So thank you for answering that. So looks like 40% have, 54% uh, know it's their first time, and there's a few that don't know, and that's perfectly fine. Um, most folks get started, most folks that I've talked to over the years and myself included, and maybe this is true for you, got started planting tomatoes. That was how they got into vegetable gardening. And uh, so tomatoes and, and spring and summer stuff is a much more common way to garden because those are, um, it's just a, it's, it takes a little more thought and planning to put in a fall and winter garden. And so um, that's a real common um, thing. Last week we talked, or two weeks ago, we talked about this, the first part of the class, and you can, you can find the link to that. Um, it will be posted in the chat, but you can also look at um, the Central Sierra Master Gardeners YouTube 
uh, presence in the Facebook group. We talked about location, where your, where your garden is, timing, that's really important for these um, kinds of vegetables, soils and fertilizers, irrigation, starting seeds, and integrated pest management. And we touched on each of those because these are good gardening practices that will help you be successful. Master gardeners uh, in your county, if you're not in El Dorado and, and in this county, have sort of whole classes or multi-class sessions on these um, topics kind of broken down, uh, soils and fertilizers, et cetera. So I encourage you to check your, to check our web presence. And we have some stuff coming up and um, to also avail yourself of other county master gardener programs. Speaking of integrated pest management, this was uh, last night, trail cam. Uh, uh, so I gardened on 3.23 acres in Georgetown at 3,000 feet. And this was a, 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 uh, a noon sighting of a fox, uh, which is pretty rare around here. Foxes tend to be sort of early morning, evening um, hunters around here. But this little champion was um, traversing the, the little firebreak road down on my property. And, and we want, this is my favorite integrated pest manager, right? We want, we want these in the garden, um, eating meadow voles and, and things. They also tend to go way, they love compost and they drag um, coffee grounds and eggshells and everything out of the compost looking for little scraps and things to eat, so. Uh, I'll start by the kind of the, by um, looking at, um, looking at timing. So, so for those, the, the 6% or so, and maybe there's more of you who don't know whether you plan to fall or winter, um, that's okay. So what we're talking about in this class is things that we're generally seeding and planting now, uh, so in August to now, and then expecting to harvest December, January, February, and in some cases um, into early spring, and in some cases all the way into kind of midsummer, early summer. And um, the master gardeners have produced this chart. This is a vegetable planting guide uh, for the foothills. And it is uh, a two-sided physical object um, that looks like that. And um, it is the most helpful, uh, it is the most helpful document uh, I've found in my whole gardening uh, life. My other, so it's key to our county, El Dorado County, and it gives a little formula for if you are sort of situated um, in Placerville or, or and uh, you can slip the dates if you live north of that, meaning your, your seasons are going to be a little bit shorter, you get colder sooner, um, and you might um, get warmer later. And down into the other parts of the county uh, where, where it is warmer sooner and uh, um, in the spring and might get colder later. So. Um, but the way the chart works, generally speaking, is that you, in the column here, um, in this column, so we just left August, here's where we would seed things and have plants and put plants in the ground. And then for cabbage, for instance, we would expect, um, we would expect to be harvesting cabbage in December. That'll be our main harvest December through early Feb and then a diminishing harvest uh, into the end of February. So that's how, um, that's how this chart works. And we, you can get this. So in the, in the, in the old days, we would have these available for purchase. They're uh, very reasonably priced and the, the proceeds go to, um, to our program and in, probably to the Sherwood Demonstration Garden, which is one of the most beautiful master gardener gardens in the world, in my opinion. Uh, here's how you can, um, they're six dollars, very reasonable for a laminated uh, chart. And uh, if someone could um, copy and paste, that'd be difficult for me. But if you put that in, you look in the chat and you will um, be able to click on that and use a check or credit card and get one of these. Um, but even if you don't have it now to refer to, just just know that right now we're planting things to be to be eaten uh, at the end of 2020 and into 2021 for most things, and then in particular for um, alliums, that's what we're planting in October and, and we'll be eating them in July. And that's kind of what a fall and winter garden is. Um, so without further ado, we will, um, here's what we're gonna be talking about. And, and one thing that I think is really interesting and, and especially if, you, if you're unsure about whether a thing is a fall or a winter thing versus a spring or a summer thing, if you think about the fruits and vegetables that we 
eat that we plant for spring and summer, they're typically the fruiting bodies, right? The body that carries the seeds. And so if you think about a watermelon or you think about a tomato or a squash or um, a pepper, those are all things where we are hoping to get the fleshy part that surrounds the seeds, right? And if you think about fall and winter vegetables, we are more or less, in most cases, getting stems or leaves uh, or immature flowers, right? So not typically the, the part that carries seeds, but some fleshy part of the plant. And so that's one way to think if you're unaccustomed to thinking about what, what is, now there, there are exceptions and there are things that can grow out of, in both seasons. Chard is one that can sort of grow anywhere um, or at most any time, but, um, but that's one way to think about it. So we'll be talking today about uh, leaf crops uh, and in particular lettuce. Uh, peas, which is one maybe exception. So peas were growing for the, the sweet pod and or the seed itself. And peas are the cool weather um, vegetable. So beans are a full summer uh, heat kind of vegetable and peas are uh, prefer cool conditions to grow. So that's maybe the one exception. We'll talk about the cool crops, which are also called brassicas or cruciferous vegetables. Uh, and that's a, a lot of the, a lot of the vegetables that you can grow are in those families. And we'll talk about the, them. Things that you grow for roots, um, so carrots and, and others. Alliums, which is a family of plants that includes a bunch of ornamentals, but also eating plants, right? So the alliums are onions and scallions and leeks and garlic and um, et cetera. And then we'll wedge perennials in here. Perennials are plants. So everything else here, we're talking about annuals. And, and what that means is you're planting them and expecting to plant and harvest in one season. They don't live year round, generally speaking. Um, but perennials we talk about in this class because perennials are things that you put in the ground in a location and they, they live for up to you know, 20 years or something. And we talk about it in this class because they become available at basically at bare root time. So at the same time in nurseries that you can get bare root trees, you'll usually find uh, artichokes and asparagus crowns and um, rhubarb and horseradish and strawberries and things like that. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about those. So let's dive right into it. Uh, and, and so for each of the kind of general categories of things, things you eat for leaves, um, most of the, the information is the same. And so you'll hear me say a million times that these plants like rich uh, soils, rich, deep, loose soils with lots of organic matter. And that's pretty much true for any, any plant or any vegetable, right? Um, and so in the first class, we talk a lot about thinking about uh, feed your soil, not your plants, and thinking about your soil as an, an organism and as the life support system for this plant, and always doing something to improve your soils, uh, either bringing in manure or compost or cover cropping. We have some, a couple of, you should go check the, um, we had some very recent Master Gardener video series up on that, uh, on the web, on the YouTube site that talk about cover cropping. And we had a lot of questions about that. Cover cropping just means planting, planting seeds of um, legumes and, and annual grasses, and then growing them specifically to be chopped down and tilled into the soil. And so the legumes, um, which are uh, typically bell beans and field peas and vetch and those kinds of things, um, add nitrogen to the soil. And the, the plant tops add just organic material and you, you till that stuff in and it breaks down and your soil becomes better over time. So, so leaf crops like rich soils as do most things. Um, uh, leaf, a lot of the plants in the, it, that you grow for leaves have very small seeds. And the kind of general rule about seeds is you plant them sort of twice as deep as they are wide. So most uh, lettuce, for instance, which we'll talk about, is uh, very shallowly planted and you don't even really dig a hole for it. You sort of maybe make a little furrow and press it into the soil and maybe lightly cover it. Um, but so most of these things, if it has a little seed, then you don't need a big old, dig a big old hole for the seed. That's just a way to, an easy way to think about it. Um, Let's talk about thinning. So, so, and this is true for pretty much any plant that you're growing as a vegetable. You want to plant them, so you can either read the seed packet, and the seed packet will always give you this a rather exorbitant spacing, um, plant to plant. Um, but if you're planting, say, in a, in, in a block rather than a row, you really want to sort of think about it on a diamond plan. And so, and you want the finished plant, if you want to imagine what the finished plant is, the size of the finished plant, and you want it to more or less touch its neighbor, 
Um, so if you're planting two broccolis, you need to have of some sense of how big a broccoli can be when it's when it's finished or when you're you know when it's big. And then the next one you want to plant uh, the seeds so that the 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 edges of those sort of two crowns of those plants touch. And if you have it in a diamond plan, then you have those two in this row, and in the next row you sort of split the difference in the middle so that you've you've created these uh, diameter triangular patterns for planting. Um, if that's confusing, don't worry about it. Just plant according to the seed packet, which will always tell you uh, to plant them whatever 12 or 18 feet apart or something. So, um, what you can do though is you can thin to that, right? So, what I do with with uh, with lettuce and with other of these things, you just plant the whole like plant a whole line of it, and then as it starts to germinate, you thin and you take out the ones that you don't, uh, leaving the final spacing, and then you can eat those, right? So. Uh, with lettuce, with any of this stuff, the young tender greens that come up uh, are sprouts and, and you can eat them. And so you're not losing anything. Um, you may be using a little more seed than you absolutely have to, but, uh, but you end up with something you can eat. So we talked about fertilizers in the prior class and we talked about NPK, which are the three sort of main things that plants need. They need a lot of other things, but that's how when you look at a fertilizer bag, those are the three numbers, right? And so um, nitrogen in particular has to do, uh, plants need that for leafy green growth, right? And so um, if you are fertilizing, then you want to think about that for, for plants that you're growing for leaves. And you can, you can apply liquid fertilizers, you know, once the plants are established, true leaves, you can apply organic, I gardener, so I only use things that uh, are organically sourced. And there's plenty of options for all kinds of gardeners. So a general purpose organic fertilizer is what I um, use when I fertilize. But I really try to think about the uh, feed the soil, not the plant. And so I really try to build the soils up so that they are uh, inherently nutritious. And um, side dressing with, uh, with compost or manures is another term I might use. And that means just piling that up sort of and scratching it in on the sides of, of um, finished or growing plants. And so, as those things get watered in, the plant's roots um, will will take them up and and um, result in kind of good plants. Um, watering is is critical, especially so we're planting a lot of these things in El Dorado County, and it could be true where you are gardening as well. It stays hot for a long time, right? And so um, you can expect to need to water um, these plants through October, certainly through, probably into November, depending on uh, what kind of a rain year. So uh, just something to consider. These aren't just because they're winter and you can imagine them being harvested in winter doesn't mean you can just put them in the ground and, and hope that uh, they'll fend for themselves in terms of water. Harvesting for leaves. So this is true for lettuce and other plants. You don't have to take the whole plant, right? So you can do uh, what's called cut and come again harvesting, meaning you take about a third of the leaves go around with scissors. So if you take a, a, let, a lettuce plant, you can go around and take a, say a third of the leaves from the outside and the plant will continue to grow uh, from that center and put out new leaves. And so you can establish your harvesting over a longer period of time. So that's true for uh, pretty much anything that, you, that, you, um, that you're growing for leaves. Problems of leaf crops. So one of the, the benefits of planting in in fall, a lot of these things, by the way, you could plant, and even the, the chart that um, when you get one or if you have one, shows that they can also be snuck in in early, early spring. So you can see these plants, you know, after the turn of the year, and you'll still get a crop. But the problem with that, I find, for the things we're talking about today, is that is also prime time aphid time, right? And so hopefully in your garden, aphids have done their thing, um, and, and they're pretty much done by this time. So um, aphids are a problem of, of all leaf plants. <laughs> um, aphids are pretty easy to deal with as long as you keep on it and they don't require insecticides. You can just wash them off and just keep on that hard hose spray. They'll, they'll drown and fall off. You can use insecticidal soap, which is a very benign um, way to deal with aphid problems. A lot of these plants also have the, the cabbage moths, so they, which will, those white uh, moths will lay eggs on the underside of leaves and then the emerging caterpillars will chew, chew through all of your beautiful uh, collards and so forth. So um, and there are some other leaf miners will sometimes go to things like chard. There, there are um, 
there are other pests and diseases. One of the things that that um, that I find is that if there's a novel problem, you can go to the vegetable resource, or I can't remember what the acronym is, but it's v VRIC, and that'll be posted in the chat as well. And there are, there are individual sort of, um, you can look at the IPM website, you can look at the VRIC, and, and there'll be like a one sheet about how to grow lettuce for the home gardener. And so you can kind of look there for growing tips. And then you can also look for pests and diseases of, of uh, problems of particular plants and plant accordingly. But, uh, but really, as aphids and cabbage moths are the big kind of big two for many of these things, and those are pretty easily dealt with, and they're very much less of a problem when you plant these things August and September and, and sort of are harvesting into December, January, because by then it's too cold for uh, or moths are out of out of season and aphids are out of season. So, so let's dive into lettuce, and I'm consulting my uh, my chart here. And so in my uh, chart, lettuce is seeded in August and into early September. And lettuce is something you typically, you can, for most of these things, you can seed them into a six pack, right? Um, and plant them out. Uh, and that's what I do for some things. I planted my full complement of winter, fall and winter vegetables in my outside nursery area. And something came along and ate it all, like literally every single seedling. And, and I'm talking about three or four flats of, of seedlings. Um, so I have had to reseed. I just reseeded a couple of days ago in a, so I'm a little bit behind, which is fine. These are the things that happen when you garden. And uh, I had amazing germination this year for the seeds that I planted. I had two day germinations on pretty much everything, kale, collards, uh, various mustards, broccoli, um, et cetera. And so I'm not too far behind, but I had to reseed all that stuff in a more sheltered environment inside a greenhouse where I think either, so the three things that eat, um, that eat seedlings in my garden are rats. <laughs> so rats will come through and they'll, they'll enjoy those while they're taking, um, these are those wood rats, those, uh, those rats that make those big elaborate nests. And then we've had, and maybe if you're in El Dorado County, I'd love to know, uh, if you have had those a crazy infestation of the caterpillars in my garden, they're eating, they're on a madrone. Madrone is a tree in this county that's a kind of an unusual jungly looking tree, but um, is pervasive at this elevation. And all of the madrones are covered in caterpillars, covered in the webs from the caterpillars, covered in the frass, the droppings of the caterpillars. And uh, some of those caterpillars have dropped down and begun to eat things on the ground as well. So I don't know what got them, but I just reseeded them. Uh, lettuce is something that you typically will just plant in place because it's sort of quick, uh, quick to grow. And, but again, you can plant it in six packs. And here's a, this is picture is from my garden. And these are uh, at the end of, you know, every season I go into my seed collection and I pull out really old seeds. So I have things, you know, going back to the early aughts. And, uh, and so for lettuce, I'll just combine all those into one big handful and um, throw that out in the garden. And then thin. And so here we have trout back, we have red oak leaf, black seeded Simpson, there's probably Paris Island Coes in here, a couple of, uh, a bunch of different lettuce varieties. Um, lettuce comes in four types. Uh, let me clear all my drawings. I don't know where the annotation is coming from, but uh, if lettuce comes in loose head types, Loose leaf types, remain types, and crisp head types. And so um, if you think about growing vegetables and plants, I'm going to lay some truth on you here. Plants, most plants, in order to actually be a plant and to live, thrive, and survive, have to make, have to have leaves, right? And so you will be a successful gardener if you plant plants that you're trying to harvest leaves. Not every plant will successfully make a big old fruit, and not everyone will successfully make any other big old structure. Um, but all plants are gonna make, not all plants, but most plants are gonna make leaves if they're to be a plant at all. So if you're just dabbling in fall and winter gardening, uh, I might not plant cauliflower. I might start with things that, that are harvested for leaves. I might start with collards, but um, in any event, lettuce is a plant that's pretty easy to grow, especially in this, uh, in this window. Lettuce is a plant that doesn't grow well when it starts to get hot, lettuce will bolt. So lettuce in, in late spring, um, will will bolt and bolting means it starts to stretch and get bitter and, and send up seed heads. 
Um, so loose head lettuces are the butterhead or bib lettuces. They have kind of a succulent leaf and a different, different um, bite. Loose leaf is where I'd start. If you've never grown lettuce, choose some varieties of loose leaf lettuce um, because they just grow sort of a big rangy looking, um, not big, but you know, a, a rangy looking plant that you can just harvest leaves from and make a salad. Romaine lettuce is a, a elongated headed lettuce. Right, so this is the classic um, Caesar salad lettuce and has a, a kind of a crunchy mid rib. And then crisp head is lettuce that many of us maybe grew up with. Uh, that's just sort of iceberg lettuce. I wouldn't grow that. There are supposedly some, some varieties that will do well in home gardens, but mostly crisp head lettuce is grown in, and, and lettuce in general is grown uh, in fields that have a, you know, marine influence and are 72 degrees year round, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're starting with lettuce, start with loose leaf is what I would do. Um, and you can just sow that or scrape. Really, you're not digging holes for lettuce. You're broadcast seeding it. You can mix it with sand um, if you want to sort of get a better distribution. And just kind of scratching with a, with a, a hoe or a ray, kind of scratching that into the soil surface rather than digging it in. And then watering it and waiting for it to do its thing. Lettuce has a um, lettuce has a, a tap root, not very big. So lettuce is really great for containers. It doesn't have a very deep root system, and has a lot of fibrous roots right at the surface, right of the of the the bed. And so it likes consistent water, and by which I mean don't it doesn't like feast or famine cycles, right? Meaning it doesn't like to be dry and then wet and then dry and then wet. So you want consistent, even watering. One way to kind of assure that is mulching. So having a good mulch program, you can mulch with lots of organic things. Mulching helps to, to helps the soil not just uh, evaporate. So a lot of the water that you're, is not evaporating if you're, if you're mulching, it keeps soils cool and sort of keeps plants on a more consistent thing. Keeps soils cooler, earthworms want to come up higher, etc. So mulching is a real good strategy. Some varieties that, that will list for these Plants are things that I've grown or that I like or that Master Gardeners in the county like. So butter crunch is kind of a classic. Loose-headed lettuce. Red oak leaf, black-seeded simpson, and Thai green are kinds that I grow when I grow loose leaf. Black-seeded simpson is a really old school variety. Red oak leaf is a pretty, um, looks like an oak leaf and it's red. Um, Thai green is a lettuce that will last a little longer in a spring garden, although that's not really an issue here. In this case, you'll be eating your lettuce in November and into December. Um, lettuce is actually remarkably hardy. It, can it stands here under snow. It can be covered in snow and be, be fine. So um, if you're late in the season and you're in a snow area, don't worry about it. It probably, it, it, it won't survive a, a bitter dry cold, but it'll survive under snow for sure. And then Paris Island Coes is the classic romaine variety that, um, that folks grow. It's been in seed catalogs since, since there were seed catalogs. So. I encourage you to try lettuce. It's a pretty easy plant to grow. And, um, and in this season, it usually won't bolt unless we have some weird heat events or something. So when it bolts, this is what it looks like. So it, that's lettuce that has gone to seed and it just throws a long flower, uh, sort of a central flower stalk and a big array of these fuzzy flowers. And uh, lettuce is a great one. It'll naturalize in your, along a fence line or at a low part of the garden. And so if you, uh, one thing that's really good, especially if you're getting into multi-season gardening, if you haven't done it before, is to throw some lettuce out by a fence line uh, somewhere and, and then let it go to seed and then see when it decides it's the right time and conditions to germinate, right? Because then you get a real sense of in your garden with your sun and with your uh, temperatures, when do things want to wake up and start growing? And so that's a good way to just kind of um, take some cues from nature and, and kind of get a sense of multi-season gardening if you have the space for it. So once lettuce is bolted, it's inedible except to chickens. And, and so it just gets really bitter and awful. So you probably won't have that problem. If you're seeding now or planting now, you'll be fine uh, enjoying some lettuce in November. Let's talk then about spinach. Spinach is one of the, one of the, in this county, and it could be true in yours as well, it's an October planted. So we're middle to end of October and into early November is when we seed spinach. 
and um, the the thought there is right you the seed wants to have a warmth for germination but then it wants to mature in a cooling uh, trend right and that's true for a lot of these plants and so spinach um, peas and faba beans and onions and garlic we want to get them get them going and then as they're maturing it's going to be cooling down so uh, because spinach will bolt just like other um, other leaf crops. And in fact, when you buy spinach and seeds, I, I should have mentioned this, lettuce you're probably going to be purchasing seeds for, although you'll, you might see, I'm not sure if, if nurseries have uh, fall and winter six packs that include lettuce, they probably do. But um, I always grow from seed because you get a much, much better variety. So you're looking for loose leaf lettuces uh, from seed. Spinach, you're looking for slow bolting, um, uh, long-standing varieties. Um, Indian summer is one that I grow. I find spinach a little difficult to get the timing right. Um, in my garden, it tends to want to bolt even if you plant it in October, sometimes depending on the way October looks, but um, you can treat it remarkably similar to lettuce. Um, and so put that in in October in El Dorado County. Chard is not on the chart for right now, but you could sneak chard in now or you could sneak it in in early spring and chard is actually very adaptable. Um, it will likewise bolt. It's a biennial and it's also, it's beta vulgaris. It's the same plant as beet. And so, um, and in fact, biennial meaning it, it uh, grows vegetatively in one, in one year and in the second year it, it um, produces seeds. Um, but chard is a little bit more forgiving of temperature and weather and, and other things. So, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate to try and sneak in some chard now or in, in early spring, um, you know, planting in February. Um, and varieties that are good for chard are, are Fort Hood Giant, uh, rhubarb chard, which is red leaf. Bright Lights is fun to grow. Master gardeners don't like it generally, I have found, because they don't like the flavor, but it's that one that looks like it's safety orange and uh, it's fun. It's fun in a garden because it at least looks nice. There's some chard in my garden. There's some beautiful chard. So that's Ford Hook Giant here on the left. Uh, it's on the left on my screen, uh, next to some uh, some ruby chard up on the top there, and then um, and then some mustard, which we'll talk about in a second on the right. Um, so you can see that's standing at the same time as some of the other plants that we're planting now. In a mixed, that's a little close maybe, but it's a nice mixed mixed leaf garden you can you can get a lot of soups and stir fries out of out of that garden and there's what chard actually there's a there's beet so there's some beets you can buy that actually uh, are for the beet part which is the sweet part and then um, they're also selected for the tops let's move on to peas peas again are the a legume meaning they are in a family of plants that fixes nitrogen in their roots um, and so they're good for the soil and they're also good to eat and they are the cool season crop. So in this county, we plant peas in October, uh, again, mid-October to, to early November. And then we can expect to be harving the, harvesting those after the turn of the year, right? Um, which is true, I should mention for spinach. You plant them in October and then you're eating in February, March. Um, so for peas, um, you planting in October and you're eating in April, May. And so that this is a thing, thing to think about. In the first part of this class, we talk about timing and planning. And so having this, this plant chart or other plant charts, and I guarantee that in your county, you can get one. If you're not from El Dorado County, you can get one for your county. Um, if you have limited space, you need to be thinking about, well, do I need to be preparing a bed for, for my spring and summer vegetables uh, you know, in, the, in the spring and, and what is planted now that's going to be maybe in that bed then. So it's a really good idea to kind of draw this out on paper. And as you get into multi-season gardening to really figure out where things are and how long they last. Peas are, there's some peas. They're grown for a lot of different things. So you can grow shelling peas, right? Which you're actually like old school, you're, you're eating the pea itself. Um, and then there's peas that are more selected for the pods. These tend to be associated with Asian cooking generally. Um, here's some sugar snap peas. Um, that have sweet pods. Peas get have problems. Um, powdery mildew can be a problem. Um, pests, animals can be a problem with peas. Squirrels in my garden will go, grab all the peas and take them just outside of reach and sit on a stump and 
eat them mocking me, um, looking me in the eye while they eat the peas. So um, you can use exclude. Uh, we talked about IPM in the last class, but you can use exclusion, um, floating row covers, netting, et cetera. And then peas generally need support. So most of these vining type plants are better off up off the ground. You can, you can reduce diseases of leaves by getting them sort of up off the ground. So peas prefer a little bit of trellising. And, and uh, peas in particular, not, they're not very robust, rugged vines the way that beans are, pole beans. So they don't need a, you know, a fortress to climb. They can, they can climb on a much sort of much more delicate structure, but they do prefer a little bit of something to climb upon. They're also, by the way, pea greens. The shoots and the end part is are delicious in a stir fry or a salad. Um, so you can eat the vegetative part of this plant as well as the peas. So something to think about. Peas you can pre-sprout, meaning that you take some peas and you soak them, and then you uh, you put them in a rolled up wet paper towel and wait for them to produce the the root to start to germinate. Right, the radical that that little root. So you'll see the pea and the little root, and then you can just delicately plant that. Um, and the reason for that is that depending on when you're planting peas, um, big things with big seeds, if they go into cold, wet soils, they can sometimes rot before they have a chance to kind of get their process going. And so um, that's true for beans and for a lot of things. Uh, depending on the conditions in your garden, if the soils are cold and wet, uh, pea might rot before you have a chance to, uh, it has a chance to get on its legs, so to speak, or on its roots. And so that's probably, in my, our county, it's probably not usually true in October, but it, anymore, who knows, right? So pre-sprouting is, is how you deal with that. They're good for raised beds because they like good drainage. And then I mentioned powdery mildew squirrels and um, birds. And, and if you're planting peas in spring, you might get aphids. You're not going to get them probably in, on October planted peas that are, you know, popping up and being, um, being vines in December. Talk a little bit about fava beans, which are also a cool season crop. Fava beans, again, we're planting in that October window, a little longer than peas to mature, so we're not eating them till end of April and into early May. They're beautiful plants. Fava beans are, are, um, are planted for lots of things. They're planted for animal feed. They're a great cover crop, and then there are varieties that are selected for sort of big pods and those big, uh, big beans. There's even, a, uh, there's even a, a long tradition in Russia and other places of reading uh, fava bean, se bean seeds. It's, it's a, like sort of a traditional practice. I think it's called fav favology or something, but one of these things where, like reading tea leaves or something, there's a way to read beans. Um, not UC research-based, but interesting nonetheless. So fava beans grow uh, in an upright habit they don't need trellising, although they can fall over, but they, even when they fall over, as with a lot of plants, they'll just keep growing. They, this is what they look like when they have um, created the bean pods, right? Baba beans are kind of a pain in that they require a two-step process for, for eating. I should mention that if you have a, uh, there, is, there are particular conditions where people cannot eat fava beans. There are, um, and if you can't, you probably know that um, already. So I should note uh, that. But um, so that's the, the bean pods there, which you crack open and inside are these lovely fava beans, but they have a, a, a seed coat, kind of a leathery seed coat. So you blanch, so you have to open all the pods and then you blanch the beans and then you squeeze them or crack them out of their seed coat until you get this, right? So this is the eating part of a fava bean. Um, so it's a two-step process doesn't take a lot of time, but it, you know, something to consider. And then they have just a rich, they're good for you, assuming you can eat them, they've got a rich flavor. I like to make a walnut uh, fava bean, um, almost a pate. So garlic and olive oil and walnuts and, and fava beans kind of crushed together to make a paste. Uh, uh, a hummus, they're good in stir fry, they're good in a lot of ways and they're good for the soil. So they, they're also something to consider as a cover crop. Let's move on to the cold crops, the brassicas, the cruciferous vegetables. And this is a really interesting family and this presents the bulk of what I grow probably for fall and winter. Cold crops and alliums are kind of the big things for me. 
they are known by all these names, cruciferous vegetables, cruciferae from cross, right? And the flowers of these, these have a cross, four petaled flowers in a cross shape. That's a, one of the family, it looks a lot like, and if I, we were in the room together, I'd ask you, what does that look like to you? And you might say it looks a little bit like a broccoli gone too far. And that's probably true. It could also be any number of, um, of plants. Some of the questions from the chat in the prior session had to do with, what if you want to plant something that's not on the chart, right? And the strategy for that is to either read the seed packet or, you know, look it up, but to think about the family in which the plant resides, right? And so cruciferous vegetables, brassicas, all of these plants, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, kailan, which is Chinese broccoli, kale, and kohlrabi are all the same plant. Um, and so, so one thing to do is like, even if, if, collards are not on the chart you'd say well it's in the in the family of broccoli so i'd probably plant it more or less when those things are planted and that's that's to give you an idea and then you might do a little more research but um, brassica oleracea is a a a very important food family of plants because all these wonderful things come from it and other brassicas uh gentia and and oh uh, because of that and you may have seen these have you seen uh Kelet? This is a this is kind of a quote unquote new thing, but it's a Brussels sprout that grows kale rosettes instead of the typical Brussels sprout heads. Um, broccolini is a cross between Chinese broccoli and broccoli, and you might see broccoli flower, which is broccoli and cauliflower. So it's a not a green broccoli head, more like a cauliflower in shape, but not white. So because these families are are because these plants are basically the same thing, they can be crossed in interesting ways. Um, that doesn't concern you as a, as a home gardener unless you're into breeding plants because this is again, traditional horticulture. This is not genetic engineering. This is like traditional horticulture, but crosses of plants are expressed in the seeds and in the next generation of plants. So um, it's not like if you plant a Brussels sprout and a kale next to each other that they're gonna make a, a kaolette in this season, right? The seeds, might do that in the next season, but um, just something to think about. And then other brassicas, bok choy and mizuna and mustards and apple cabbages, canola, rutabagas, tatsoi, which is spoon mustard and turnips um, are all in this family. So they all are more or less, um, some of them take a little longer, Brussels sprouts in particular take a, a longer time to get big and mature, but, um, but you can kind of narrow down uh, things that are not on the chart by just figuring out what family they're in. They like, as with most things, um, this is a picture from my, in fact, all these, there's maybe one picture in this presentation that's not stuff from my garden, but, um, but they almost all are. And this is a, a beautiful little um, Brock of flower. I think a minaret might be the variety. Um, it has that, it's, it's, there's beautiful picture. I'll show you a beautiful, oh no, I have a picture later, but it's a, not a Mandelbrot set, but it's a Julia set, right? It's a, it's a fractal. It's a beautiful fractal pattern. I think it's closest to the Julia set, but. They like rich, deep soil. Uh, you'll want ones, so when you look at a seed packet, they'll say, they'll often have the word early. That just means that they're going to sort of be, from seed to plant is a shorter than, it might be 60 days, it might be 90 days, but not 120, 120 days, right? So generally speaking, you want, um, and that's especially true if you're planting in the spring. Um, for these things now, you're planting these now. Like now is the time to put in most of the coal crops to, to grow from seed or to find uh, plants at the nursery in a six pack. Um, they have lots of pests, but again, less so in fall. They have lots of spring pests, not so many in the, in the fall. They are big, can be really big plants. So if you've seen a full fledged kind of broccoli or cabbage plant, they can be, you know, big. And so that's just something to consider. And you can cite, they like, um, they're big, robust plants, so they like side dressings. You can, again, that means taking some fertilizer, um, some manures or some other things and kind of scratching it in on the sides of the plants where those, those feeder roots that are up near the top of the soil can pick that up when they're irrigated in. Let's talk about them a little bit individually. There's broccoli. Broccoli, so again, as I mentioned, if you're planting things for leaves, you're probably gonna be super successful. And if you're asking the plant to do something else, such as to create a beautiful flower head, um, you're asking more of it. So uh, I encourage you to feel successful even if you don't get the kind of heads of broccoli and, and cauliflower that you buy in the market are, are 
are not necessarily what you're going to end up with. You might, and good on you, but those plants typically are um, varieties that are specific to, you know, mechanized agriculture, and they take a lot of inputs of nitrogen and other things, and, and they're, they're, um, they're not necessarily what the home gardener, the varieties that the home gardener grows. So this is a wonderful bro broccoli floret, and the variety that the varieties that I like to go and that I recommend master gardeners grow or gardeners in, in anywhere grow are these re-sprouting or reheading kinds of types. So they'll create uh, calabrese is the the main one that I recommend, but it'll make a, a central broccoli and but not huge, but you know, pretty good size, maybe a baseball to softball size. And then it will you cut that one off and you leave the plant and then it will re-sprout and make these little florets uh, everywhere there's um, everywhere a leaf meets the stem. And so they'll, the way the tomatoes do almost, where in that little node, they'll create little things and you can harvest those over a longer period of time. So uh, just a consideration, uh, rather than sort of expecting one giant head and then the plant's done, thinking about it as, as harvesting over a longer period of time. Broccoli, again, early varieties mature in 60 days, um, later varieties mature in 110 days. That's just something, read the seed packet or read the variety they're choosing. Um, and it really, it applies more when you're planting those things, trying to sneak one in and planting in February and trying to get it in before the hot weather. If you're planting now, you're going to be eating broccoli in November, December, and in, into January with a diminished harvest. Aphids and worms, we've talked about. Row covers, I've mentioned that before, but if you don't know what that is, it's a, a very light, uh, fabric-y material, but super, super light and, and, um, and can be laid right over plants, and they'll grow right under it. And... Or you can produce, you know, you can have hoops that kind of keep it up off the plant, but they just keep the the aphids from and the the moths from getting on the plant. And so, um, row covers can be um, uh, very effective. And then calabrese is the is the one to grow. There's that picture I was talking about. So that's a that's probably a a, a broccoli cauliflower cross that demonstrates that beautiful repeating mathematical. That's just a beautiful plant. Cauliflower is in this family and there's one that I grew and I felt really successful. I find cauliflower to be hard to grow myself. Um, and so that was about that big maybe, it was like two fists big or you know like a handful big or maybe softball size. And I felt really successful about that. Um, it was not as big as the one you might buy in the market but I, I knew where it came from and I grew it myself. And so um, cauliflower, again, planted now in this county, and you're eating that in November. So a very short maturing plant. Um, you can, it'll get green. So that flower head, that's the immature flower, right? And it, it will get green. So you can blanch it. So, or I guess that's the term. You cover it with the leaves and kind of loosely tie the leaves to keep some of the sun off them. Because the sun getting on that, um, that flower head will start to turn it green. Not a big deal, it's not poisonous or anything, but it just doesn't look, it starts to look less like um, cauliflower and it can get brown and kind of look funky, so. Um, but again, it can be a big plant, you know, an arms, like a whole, all of your arms uh, in a circle kind of plant, so. I don't grow, so, so for some of these, I don't grow them every year. Like I don't grow every one of these things every year. I Every year I grow things for leaves and then every other year say I'll grow cauliflower. I probably put broccoli in every year, but um, I like them all. It's just that how much effort versus the the reward and how much plant are you getting out. And so the kohlrabi is delicious. So this one, again, this is we're eating the fat stem of this plant. And there's a kohlrab, as they say, and it looks like the leaves look like everything else in this in this family. And in fact, you can eat the leaves. They taste like everything else in this family. By the way, you can eat cauliflower leaves and broccoli leaves, and they all taste more or less like cabbage or, or collards. Uh, but the kohlrabi, you're growing it for that, that um, baseball to, you know, football, not football, basketball sized um, fleshy stem part, which is so good because you can just take that, you can peel it, it has a thick kind of outer um, layer. You peel that off and you can just eat it like an apple. And it's like eating an apple made out of the tender white inside of a broccoli stem. That's kind of how I would describe it. So uh, a fun plant to grow and, and definitely try that uh, if you like things in this family. 
there's one in, uh, this is in the Botanical Garden in University of British Columbia up in Vancouver, BC, Canada. And kohlrab kohlrabi comes in purple varieties too. So there's one that's purple. Um, so you can find, and this is a plant they grow competitively, right? So in Alaska, you'll get these kohlrabs that are, you know, 200, 300 pounds or whatever. Um, but in the home garden, in my garden, they, they're baseball to, to, you know, softball type size. And can be included in stir fry, used, used as anything, used as broccoli or cauliflower in the same kind of recipes or just eaten out of hand. And then kale. So if, again, if you're just starting, start with things that grow leaves. Kale is, uh, is all the rage, right? It has been for years. Kale is a wonderful plant in its family, very easy to grow, um, very robust plant. Comes in interesting varieties like this one, which is probably Lacinto kale. And then there's crinkly varieties. There's, there's ones that are more blue versus ones that are more green. Um, and, and just easy to grow. Um, kale is not, as far as I know, on the chart, but I would be planting kale now because, again, it's in the same family as broccoli and cauliflower and so forth. So I'd be seeding, seeding uh, in August into now, and I had to replant all my kale. I'm growing this year a blue, blue kale, um, uh, one that's more like this, and uh, just a really nutritious plant and, and very, very easy to grow. Here's an interesting kale in my garden. This is, um, if you've ever been to Mendocino, uh, the Mendocino headlands there are covered in kale. And the kale is escaped from uh, Chinese kitchen gardens in the town of Mendocino. Uh, and it grows in that stalk form, right? Kale will mostly do that. If you let it go, it sort of starts to send up each year's growth because it'll, it'll, it'll last year round. And so these are, um, these are seeds collected from the Mendocino headlands of, uh, and there's a million of them uh, out there. Um, they're all over the sand. They grow at the, in the sand, literally at the base of the cliffs, like on the beach, um, non-native to that part of the world. Uh, but they, they grow unirrigated in my forest. Um, so they don't need a whole lot of care and tending and each year they just get a little bit taller. Not the greatest kale to eat. Uh, it's, a, it's very tough and, and um, it tastes good, but it tastes strong. So if you're not, if you don't like uh, plants in that family, that strong kind of kale, broccoli type taste, and you might not. And collards are another one that, like kale, very easy to grow. Here are collards in my garden, and you can see they're next to beans. Um, that's the scarlet runner bean there on the left. And so that indicates to me that uh, kale is a longer lasting in the heat. It's much more tolerant of heat than some of these plants are. Um, so this would have been something that either overwintered in my garden or I planted in the early spring. And, and that's probably in a, a May or June, um, that's probably a May or June collard green. You can see in the lower right hand corner, the leaves there I have a little bit of pest problems. That's probably chewing caterpillars doing that. Um, but, but again, that's not something to worry about, right? You can cut those parts out or take that leaf and throw it away. What, what, what is to worry about is not to let the plant get so infested that you lose the crop. So the, the best pesticide is the gardener's shadow, as Carolyn Stromberg, who used to teach this class with me many years ago. Um, and that just means being in your garden, looking on the underside of the leaves, looking at it at night. Many of these things go out to chew at night. So if you have a problem, and then adopting IPM, integrated pest management strategies, when you, when you kind of discover what the problem is. Let's talk about mustards. And mustards here, I'm talking about leaf mustards. Although the plants that produce seed mustards and the yellow mustard and all that other stuff um, are either in the same family or in B, Napas or other uh, allies. But mustards, if you like greens, then I encourage you to grow mustards. They're the easiest green to grow in my view. Uh, they, uh, this is a Gai Choi, Gai Lan. This is a, a giant red mustard. I grow it every year, I'm growing it this year. Uh, it produces a big, wonderful plant with that kind of purple or burgundy tinged leaves. It is a robust mustard. And if you, meaning a spicy, strong flavored mustard, all you need for this one is to take some leaves and put them in a hot wok with, a, with maybe a little bit of garlic and it makes its own broth, but it is an assertive, um, an assertive mustard. So if you don't like that, you might not like this one. There are much more gentle mustards that you can that you can find that don't have that strong, strong flavor. Um, but if you like strong, get some giant red mustard. 
grow some cabbage. Here's a cabbage plant. Again, cabbage in, in the same family looks like a broccoli when I let it go too far and go to seed, right? Um, that cabbage was should have been harvested. I probably planted it in the wrong season. Uh, that There's garlic in the ground, so it's hard to tell when this was, but um, that cabbage decided it was time to make a seed stock. And there's nothing you can do really to, to convince it. Otherwise, you can still eat all that. It doesn't get bitter exactly the way that that lettuce does, but uh, I think I include this just to show that that looks a whole lot like a, a broccoli. So these plants are all pretty much the same thing. So that's the cruciferous vegetables, the coal crops, um, and I encourage you to explore that family of plants for your fall and winter garden. Let's talk a little bit about root plants. Plants we're growing for the, the subsurface, the subsoil. Um, Soil is important, right? This makes sense because what you're expecting to harvest is below the soil. So if your soils are dense and compacted and full of rocks and not loose, then you're gonna get um, roots that are maybe truncated or stunted or not able to really grow to their full potential. So you'll wanna prepare a deep soil. Um, and depending on what you're growing, deep is, deep is a relative term, right? Um, most of these things are in the six to 12 inch range, I guess, for the home gardener. Although you can grow, you know, 15 foot carrots in sand beds, which they do competitively, but you're mostly looking at things that are, you know, if you got 18 inches of good soil, you're probably good. Uh, we, carrots for, for instance, we're planting in, in August. We're a little bit outside of carrot time, but I would, that I would, I wouldn't not plant them. There's something that go over winters. And so, so even if you're late, it just means that, that you will probably, assume you can get them up and germinated, right? Meaning they start to, to do plant things, and then you're, you'll probably get a crop of car carrots, but you might be looking at January into uh, February and March. The variety is important. This is true for carrots because when you buy carrot, you know, you, you may be not trying to, to, to grow carrots that are two feet long. You're probably looking at carrots that are uh, one inch down to say six or 12 inches or eight inches. Um, so look at the seed packet for the kind of carrots that you're trying to grow. Thinning is critical because uh, in the case of root plants, right, so when I talked about plants that are above ground, you want them to be sort of just touching their neighbor in their finest, biggest form, but the roots, um, you don't want them overlapping and crossing, right? So it, um, you, can, you can plant them sort of much, much closer together because the root itself doesn't occupy much space in the, in the horizontal dimension, but you just don't want them overlapping because they'll they'll kind of wrap around each other and you won't get in sort of nice individual carrots. Carrots have some pests. There are some some things that'll chew holes in them, sort of like James and the giant peach um, under the soil. Not usually a big deal. White flies can go to carrot carrot tops and carrot crowns. Uh, there are some other, but pests are not a, not in my experience a big deal with with um, with root crops. And there's some carrot tops. This is, this is actually, a, this was taken during one of the eclipses a couple years back um, where all the shadows were circles within circles because of the way that the eclipse was. Um, carrots are a pretty plant. There's some carrots. You all know what carrots look like perhaps, hopefully. Um, if not, you're in for a treat because carrots are sweet and delicious. Um, if you're cho when you're choosing a variety, you want to choose shorter ones. I think there's a chart in here that shows because um, carrots, now you can get a great variety, ones that are sort of the size of a little radish and little round ones, and on up to Nantes and Danver, which are the two varieties. Um, you, they harvest over a long time, so carrots planted in August, you're, you'll have carrots, you know, December through March. Um, and carrots come in different shapes, in round and in tapered. Tapered are easy to pull, especially if kind of have compacted soils. It's a bummer to be pulling on a carrot and have it be non-tapered and break in half in the soil. This soil being super important, here's a great example. Nothing wrong with this carrot other than it's kind of funny looking, but that encountered something, a rock or another root or something and uh, diverted its attention to going around it. Here's the carrot chart. So if you look at right dead center in the middle of the chart there is, is where, where you're, if you've never grown carrots or you, you want just sort of good quality carrots that are six inches long, go for those two varieties, Nantes and Danver. They're, they're varieties that are easy to find, easy to grow relative to carrots. The thing about carrots, they take a long time to germinate. So you, you need to mark the rows. Sometimes you seed carrots and you don't know when, it, it might be a month or, or even much longer before they sort of pop up. So 
just remember where you planted them. Sometimes people interplant them, get a handful of carrot seeds and a handful of uh, radishes and just sort of broadcast seed that and then the radishes will germinate the minute they touch the soil pretty much. And so um, as you're pulling radishes, you can be thinning the carrots sort of simultaneously. Turnips, anyone play Animal Crossing? So turnips, is, uh, turnips are great. Uh, and I encourage you to grow turnips. This is a turnip from my garden this year, best turnips I've ever had. I was not prior to this this year a turnip gardener, not be, for any reason other than I guess I just never thought about it. But uh, but I had great turnips this year, and so I had turnips. Um, this would have been like an early spring, I think. That uh, and let's see where does the chart have us planting turnips? Yeah, sort of now. So we're planting turnips now. Um, these are direct seeded, so I should have mentioned this. And with root stuff, you generally just want to seed these where they're going to be because you don't want them to be in a six pack uh, if you can help it and have them start making root systems and then fussing with those roots to, to replant them. So to the extent possible, plant them where they're gonna be. So we're, we're planting turnips now, seeding them now, August and early September, and you'll be expecting to eat them in November, December, January. My turnips I planted in early spring. You can sneak a crop in then, similar to, to a lot of this stuff. Like you can, you can get in a crop of broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, lettuce with a January or February planting, but again, pests and diseases. But that was, a, that was a turnip I was excited about. And then radishes, super easy to grow, great for, uh, the, ironically great for children's growing. I'm not sure that all children love the, the taste of radishes, but they're a plant that's really easy to, to grow and germinate. Tur we're right in like prime radish planting season right now. So seed some radishes and you'll be eating them in, you know, in a month, uh, end of October. Um, as a nurse plant, I mentioned that uh, with carrots, so mixed in with carrots. You can plant radishes a lot of times of the year. They, in, when it's hot, um, they end up being kind of woody and um, overly radishy, I would say. So, but you can exploit the shade of a tomato plant or et cetera and, and sneak some, some radishes in just because they're so quick to, to grow. And they come in such a nice variety these these days. So the classic kind of red on the outside, white on the inside, but there's all kinds of pink and blushing ones and icicle types and Asian types and French breakfast radishes and um, all kinds of different sizes and shapes and colors. And some that are particularly, you know, radish greens can be good. Some, some that you can plant um, for tender young green. Um, there's just a classic radish, right? Uh, radishes are, if you like radishes, right? Grow radishes. So that takes us, those are the roots. Let's talk about the alliums because one of my favorite groups of plants, let me do a time check. Okay, we're doing well. Um, alliums are grown, that's the fancy name for onions and their ilk. They're grown ornamentally. So this form, that's, that's onion flowers. And so you can buy these as landscape plants specifically for these pom-pom type flowers. There's a bee. Uh, eating bees love onion flowers. I often wonder if it'd be interesting. I wonder what honey from bees that nectared entirely on onions would taste like, but uh, might be interesting. Here's a wild, that's a field of wild onions. This is in Desolation Wilderness on the backside of uh, Rockbound Valley, up over Rockbound Pass and around Lake Schmidl and other places. So um, it's neat if you're hiking um, and you you can smell right a field of of wild onions um, as you as you happen long before you happen upon them. Um, but we're talking about in this family onions and garlic, leeks and shallots typically, and and so let's talk about the particulars of that. The chart so in in El Dorado County these again are an October planting thing, and some of them like onions and leeks you plant seeds typically and others of them garlic and shallots you plant the cloves right or the bulbs so there's uh there's more wild onions and in fact as as you start to recognize the plant this is a uh, this is heading up towards the old army pass at um mount it's not not the big mountain but the one right next to it i'm spacing on langley sorry um, so onions, onions, right? Now we're talking about onions, which are typically the round, uh, the round ones, right? They come in a variety of, 
of strengths and colors and forms. So you'll see the term American onion. Those are typically strong, right? They have a strong oniony flavor. They make you cry kind of an onion. And those come in red, yellow, and white globe types. And, and any more you can find um, torpedo types or, or elongated um, bulb types. And then mild onions or European onions, which are ten, tend to be smaller and tend to have a milder flavor or a sweeter flavor. And those come in red, yellow, and white. And then bunching onions or scallions. So um, things in this family, you can eat the, the leaves and the vegetative parts, right, as green onions. Uh, if you do that, you're not going to get, like if you eat all your green onion tops for your, when you're planting um, round onions, you're not going to get much in the way around onions because they need that growth to kind of grow the bottom part. But uh, there are poorly planted. I mentioned documentation. This is pic I take pictures of my garden and I look back and think, what was I thinking? So you can see some spacing problems in my photo. These are just regular old onions and they're touching and overlapping when they're not finished. And I didn't do a great job of, of figuring out spacing on these particular onions. And I planted them in a weird, like it looks like three rows too far apart. But this is why we, you know, we always strive to improve, right? So, um, so anymore, I would have planted these more on diving patterns. So I would have exploited some of that middle space between those three rows. I wouldn't have planted them so close together. Um, I would have done this a little different, or these days I would do it a little differently. They're funny. They're, so that's a, the part of the onion, the bottom part that you cut, typically cut off when you're cooking them. It's called the chef's mustache sometimes. That's, a, that's an onion in my compost growing upside down, roots up. Um, they want to survive. You should not, generally speaking, grow onion, market onions. So you should not grow onions from onions that you buy in the market, more or less. Uh, they're usually the wrong types. They're probably grown in the wrong place. They're probably designed uh, to be market type onions that'll last in a truck. You know, there's, there's a lot of reasons. They might have viruses. Uh, that would impact the plant. So generally speaking, you want to get onions from seed. Um, you'll see onions in sets, little bulbs, uh, in around the time when other bulbs are around. And the Master Gardener Handbook, which is somewhere around here, says don't use those. They're not very successful. And so I wanted to test that theory, and I tried planting from those sets that you buy in a bag, and they were not successful. Uh, they were correct, at least for me in my garden but you can get them as seeds, or you can buy onions in six packs. They look like grass, right? And you can tease those apart. And, and that'll make like a six pack of, of onion starts. It'll make 25 or whatever row feet of onions. Cause you get a hard water spray and maybe a plastic fork and you can tease each one of those little grass things apart. They have remarkably resilient, strong roots, even at that size. And you can tease that apart and make that at row and row, at row after row of onions. So a six pack goes a long way if you can find those uh, right now or in, in, um, uh, in October. Uh, so that's, that's worked very well for me or from seed. Um, picking the right variety of onions is, is important, right? Um, but the, typically the ones that um, you can buy, I usually grow them from six packs. And so the ones that are available uh, are because onions are day length dependent, meaning that they um, decide whether to bulb um, based on the, the length of the day. And so if you get an onion that is, uh, that doesn't bulb up, you can still eat the tops and so forth, um, but it is probably because it's a variety that is a, a, a long day versus short day. Let's move into garlic because garlic is my favorite thing. That's garlic from this year. Um, do I have that around here? I do. This is garlic from this year. And uh, I tried braiding it. I didn't do a great job, but I did an okay job. And garlic is really easy to grow. It makes you feel very successful uh, if you like garlic because it's really easy to grow. And you end up planting uh, one garlic bulb and you end up getting a lot of garlic out of it. And it lasts until it's time to plant garlic again. Garlic's one of those things where when you're planting a garden, you really need to know that you're putting it in October and you're not harvesting it until June, July. So it shouldn't be in the middle of other stuff where it's gonna be disturbed. It really needs to be its own kind of thing because it sits long enough to where it would interrupt your planting for spring and summer. So it, it sort of exists as its own block and it needs to um, be thought of that way. Uh, here again, 
Yeah, garlic's super robust, right? It, you put it in in October, it stands under snow. Um, here, it, uh, here I did not plant it very well, right? Too wide of a spacing, uh, I didn't know. And so anymore, I would have planted this much more thickly. I would have considered in this case, so there's garlic like right in the middle of everything. You can see to the left of that are my tomatoes for that year and peppers to the right are probably tomatoes and uh, squash. And so I had to, I couldn't use the big tiller right in this plot of land. Um, this is before I was in raised beds uh, because the garlic I was sitting there right in the middle, uh, getting ready to be disturbed by, by everything. So I would have thought about this a little differently. Here it is, here I have, this is more like I plant garlic now. This might be a little bit close together, but um, I put sticks in. So I plant three or four kinds or four or five kinds of garlic. And, and rather than mark the rows, I just put a stick in and the, the chunk in the near field is one kind, the chunk between the next two sticks is a different kind and everything after the stick in the back is a third kind. And I plant a lot of garlic. Like the braid that I held up, I have three of those and that's just a soft neck and I don't usually grow very many soft necks, but, um, but, uh, but this year I did. Here's this year's garlic, which is harvested now, right? So I would have planted that last October, about a year ago. And I harvested this, you know, it's more or less around July 4th or somewhere in there. Um, and I go, if I grew this year, one, two varieties were really tall and made very big, uh, bulbs. And then the varieties in the near, near ground are, uh, much, much smaller plants and much smaller bulbs. I'm going to stop this for a second and show you, let's see if this works. So garlic, garlic is comes in sort of two varieties hardneck and softneck so this is a hardneck garlic and this is a softneck garlic and a hardneck garlic as the name implies has a woody central stem and i like hardneck garlic and here's why because it is so if we take the paper away this is garlic from this year it has it's just more definitive there are like six one two three four there's four cloves here and they crack off really easy and they're huge and so that to me is a lot easier to process and then you end up with this there's the there's the hard neck the woody stem right that goes in the compost and then each of these is just one beautiful luscious uh, clove of garlic whereas uh, soft neck garlic so here's a soft neck garlic and this is maybe much more like the traditional garlic you buy in the market although I don't know maybe you can buy hard neck in the market I don't know if that's true or not but this is a braiding garlic right so it has a soft it doesn't have that woody stem in the middle and it has a lot more fussy so it's got a lot of fussy little little cloves and they get fussier and littler as you get towards the middle right and sometimes out towards the outside so um, it's just a little harder to process, still delicious. And, you know, there's reasons to buy this garlic because it braids and some of them last a little bit longer, but, um, but I tend to favor hard neck garlics and I encourage you to do. So you would take this. Here's the thing about garlic. The hardest thing about it is that um, you say you have to save that. So, so you plant this and this became that. So it's like a one to five, one to six for hard neck garlic, right? So the, the trick is you got to take the, the however much garlic you want, you take the best, the biggest, the most luscious heads of garlic, bulb, bulbs of garlic, and you have to save those. You don't get to eat those. You save them until, so you pull those out of the ground in July, you put them in a paper bag in a cool, dark place, and then you forget about them until October, where you dig them out, you break them apart as I just did, and you plant each one of these about, I'd plant them maybe like that far apart because the you saw how big the finished form was. Right, so you want the finished forms to be like next to each other, but not on top of each other. And you plant this part, paper and all, root side down, and either just at the, so the soil would be just at the top of that or, or you know, slightly above it. And then that will wake up in October and start to grow. And then it'll grow until it gets cold It'll, it'll sit fine under snow or, or bitter cold. I like to mulch garlic. It has a, the roots in garlic are often just right at the, a lot of them are right at the surface, right? And so by the time, again, this is gonna be in the ground in the hot summer. So, so it's easier to mulch it when they're 
when they're little than it is to try and put a bunch of mulch around it after the fact. So I try to mulch it up uh, once they've once they've once they've emerged, right? And then and then you wait and and in July or whatever you end up with um, you end up with garlic. And one of the other benefits of growing garlic from growing garlic in the home garden is scapes. So a garlic scape is this this flower spike right here. And um, this flower spike is delicious, and it's a gourmet item, and it's um, it's tender from about where you break it from the plant all the way out to about here. So each plant just produces one. In my garden, that's on or around the end of May, so in the May 20s usually, and and you can cut that here, and then you can cut off, nip off the flower part here, and you can. Um, saute that uh, there's a, a whole handful of scapes from garlic and they, they they tend to be all at the same time per per variety right more or less so you get that that's another good thing what sometimes it's fun to have plants where they produce everything all at once like uh, plum tomatoes are that way right you have all the tomatoes you need to make big batches of something and so you can just saute those up or Put them in a hot wok with a little bit of pepper and uh, and and olive oil, and they they have a bite like asparagus, but they taste like asparagus. They taste like garlic, so it's like asparagus made out of garlic, and they're a wonderful byproduct of of having garlic in your home garden. When garlic is ready, so in in you know late June, ish, the garlic will start looking terrible. Um, and that it sort of starts to signal that it's about done. Sometimes it'll fall over. Sometimes it'll start just looking haggard. What you don't want to do is uh, interpret that as it needing a whole bunch more water because then you get it to be, you know, that sooty kind of black mold that goes around um, uh, garlic. You don't want that. So uh, if it's late June, that doesn't mean your garlic needs water. It just means it's done. It starts to fall over sometimes. I'll just suspend watering at that point and let it kind of uh, do its thing. And it'll look like the tops are dying. And then you pull them up out the ground and hang them up somewhere. I, I like to hang them on the undersides of market umbrellas where they're got good air circulation, but not direct sun. And wait for the kind of the finished, wait for this woody stem uh, to, to be fully dried out. And then you can cut that part off, cut off the, the roots and store them. They make great, you can lacto ferment garlic, you can do all kinds of things with it. And, and I usually can't even get through the amount of garlic that I grow as a fresh product, but in the right conditions, it will simply dry out in the bulb. And then you can use that in, in winter beans, you can ferment that stuff. It will even do, and I'm gonna do more deliberate stuff. Sometimes it gets this great, it becomes um, like clear and it, what it's doing is going going on the way to being black garlic and the Maillard reaction and all that. And you can actually do that deliberately by wrapping uh, garlic in aluminum foil and, and giving it just the right moist but, but warm conditions and it'll actually turn into to a sort of a different product. So I'm gonna do that deliberately this year. Sometimes it just happens automatically, which is really fun. But. I encourage you to go garlic. It's really easy. It doesn't really have pests. The only pest or disease of garlic I've ever had is rust. So rust, which is looks like rust on leaves. I've had rust go to garlic when I planted it too closely together. So that you know it was an airflow, uh, it was an airflow issue. Elephant garlic you might see is is more related to a leek, but it's also fun to grow because it creates you know one big, uh, typically one big sort of garlic clove. There's elephant garlic in my garden. That's what you plant. You plant that chunk. And ideally, you get several of those chunks. In my garden, in one year, it doesn't do this. Here's what it does in one year. It starts, it makes one sort of big, big kind of clove that looks like an onion, but it but is, has a, that elephant garlic characteristic of being really kind of soft and not as sharp, maybe as a, or not as garlicky. And then it makes these little escape pods. And if I leave that in the ground over the, over the years, those will sort of turn into bigger um, and it'll cluster out. You can pull those off and plant them out. I plant them out in the woods and stuff. Shallots are similar. There's shallot plants. 
there's uh, there's a harvested shallow plant. So for and I'd pull that apart, and for every one of those cloves, you'd get a plant like this. Um, shallots are interesting because they well they're delicious, right? But this is a variety that sort of grows like this, and then there's plenty of varieties that grow like this. So it's more like a one to five or one to yeah, you get one to, you end up with six from planting one. Um, as opposed to that, where you end up sort of clustered and bunched together. And that just is, depends on the variety and, and the characteristic of the plant. Um, but a good shallot harvest, there's a good shallot harvest. And shallots are a little fussy because they're sort of fussy to deal with, but here's the way to deal with them. You, you know, get rid of the greens and the roots and then just bake them for a long time. You make like a shallot mush. You can process this all into a shallot mush uh, that, you know, on a low, you bake them low and uh, maybe with a little oil. And then you can freeze that and it and it makes a rich, wonderful kind of shallot sauce. They make a pretty, that this is for Kathy. Um, Kathy's a master gardener who's no longer with us. And they make an interesting bowl bill. So that, that top structure there, um, garlic will do this too. If you let it flower, it'll make little garlics on the top and you can plant them. It'll take forever for them to get up to kind of a big size, but um, um, this is the theory, not the theory, but this is the way walking onions, if you've heard about walking onions, they sort of grow up and they have little onion bowl bills on the top. They fall over those root and the thing walks along the landscape over many years. So. And any more, I, I, this last, we, I planted um, potato onions. These are old fashioned onions called multiplier onions. You can find them in very esoteric catalogs, but they basically are, they do, they have the shallot habit of, um, the shallot habit of kind of clustering up, but in an onion form. So you plant this one onion and then they start to do the shallot thing where they, they are multiplying uh, below the ground. So, and that's the alliums. I encourage you to grow some. And if, you, if you've never done it, start with garlic, easy as pie. Let's talk a little bit about perennials and then we'll be at time. So perennials, again, perennials are that you put them in the ground and you expect them to, to yield for eight, 10, 15, 20 years, depending. So you'll wanna pick a good spot and a spot that's out of the way and you'll wanna really work the soil because what you know, plants aren't able to, what's in the soil where they are, they don't move quite a lot, right? They send roots out, but you want the soil to be really good where they are, especially if you wanna have a long harvest. Phosphorus is not very mobile in soils and so you'll wanna add that. And you can look for that on the fertilizer bag or you can look for amendments. Um, but just build up a nice spot if you're putting in your artichoke and asparagus beds and uh, work them for a couple of years, do cover cropping, bring in compost, get them really nice and ready and then plant into them. Artichokes are hard for me to grow, but I know gardeners in our county are successful. I never am successful, but I keep trying. Um, because of course artichokes are grown mostly not in El Dorado County, right? They're grown in, in coastal valleys with fog and marine layer influences and year round 72 temperatures and those kinds of things. But, um, for artichokes, you're eating the immature flower head, right? Here's the best artichokes I've ever seen. This is this, and the reason for that, look at those beautiful artichoke plants. Look at the soil. It's because it's giraffe manure and, uh, and zebra manure. This is at the B. Bryan Preserve at Point Arena out on the coast, where there happens to be a, a, rare, uh, a rare giraffe and zebra breeding program. And so they have, and I got, I, I'm gonna admit, this is gardening nerd stuff, but I asked if I could have um, manure when I went to visit and they said yes. So I brought home a bag of zebra manure and giraffe manure for my compost. Um, so again, artichoke is a little specific to, uh, to location. In my garden, it likes a filtered sunlight because it's just too hot otherwise. And I, I have much more success with cardoon or in a, uh, the Italian uh, cardoni, which is uh, in the artichoke family, which is just a thistle, right? But Cardoon is grown for the stalk, and so it, it, it looks like an artichoke plant, but the stalks uh, are a lot like uh, celery, not in terms of flavor, but in terms of the bite and mouthfeel, but they taste like that back-end sweetness of, of artichoke. So um, you can try cardoon if, if artichokes don't work in your garden. And then rhubarb, people love it or hate it. Rhubarb is great because it's the harbinger of spring in my garden. When the rhubarb pops up, you know it's about to be spring. Same with, same with asparagus. Rhubarb uh, is a plant that's perennial, but likes to be you know, broken up and moved around every say five years or so. It grows 
in a plant like this. Some years it's red and some not. This is a red rhubarb, but in, uh, in its early phases, it's often not as red as you would see on the, when you buy it. You buy this as a lump usually, and it's a weird looking um, nugget of, of roots and, and crown, and you put it in the ground or you chop it into fours, with, and then you, and it grows up. And then, you know, you never want to take more than say a third of any particular plant um, at a picking. Because you need them, so for all these plants, you need them to have some green tops to be able to photosynthesize and store what they need to store to get through the next year. And all of these things die to the ground uh, in the winter or in the late summer in the winter, and then they come back in the early spring. So rhubarb is, uh, rhubarb, I let it go to flower one time. You generally don't want to do that for these plants. Not, not because it's a problem, but because you want them to devote energy to making leaves not flowers right and plants when they start flowering they put a lot of energy into trying to make seeds so but that's what a rhubarb flower looks like and they make a fun papery a seed that's a flat seed encased in a, a papery uh, wrapper and rhubarb is uh you know it's quote unquote poisonous it you it needs to be cooked uh but it's not poisonous in the sense like if you you'd have to eat a lot of rhubarb raw to get sick and you'd get sick long before you got poisoned you know it's one of those things but it, um, you, you eat the stalks of rhubarb and you, you cook them. My favorite recipe, you'll either gasp and wince or you'll be stoked about this, but four cups of rhubarb with some tapioca to thicken it up and like at maybe one and a half, two cups of sugar. And you put that, you stir all that together. You put that in a baking dish, like a nine inch or eight inch baking dish. You take a box of yellow cake mix. You put that on the top. You cut up at least a stick of butter all on the top of that yellow cake mix and you put that in the oven and it's heaven and until the, the top is browned and it mixes well with other uh with strawberries and other things you can make it into jam people either love rhubarb or they hate it and i have found so. i love it let's talk about asparagus here's asparagus asparagus is a beautiful plant this is asparagus in fall it has a thready fern like um, countenance and it turns beautiful colors it's a perennial that, that lasts for many years. It's drought tolerant once established. So you'll see rhubarb growing wild along train rights, train track rights of way and other things. It is a plant where you generally want male plants. And the reason is sort of what I alluded to in, in, in the rhubarb discussion. And that is that you want the plant to devote energy, not to making berries, but to making stalks. And so you'll see they always have heroic male names like Jersey Giant, Jersey King, and Jersey Knight. I guess they grow a lot of asparagus in New Jersey. So UC 157, Jersey Giant, Jersey Knight. Um, there are purple varieties now, and there are ones that, um, that have less green color, and you can blanch and make uh, light or white asparagus. You can buy asparagus as seeds, but you'll typically buy it as crowns when it's bare root season. So the same time you go to a nursery to, and you get bare root trees is when you'll see uh, asparagus and it'll be packed, you know, it'll be in a big box with a bunch of sawdust or whatever. You plant it in trenches uh, because you want the final sort of crown to be more or less 18 inches below the soil and you fill in, and I have pictures of this, you fill in as the plant grows so that um, so that by the time you reach back soil surface level, the roots are kind of way down there. And then asparagus is one of these things where you're not really eating it much until like year four. So it's a very much a patience crop. And if you grow from seed, you've added a year to that. So I really, I really recommend going from crowns. First year, you just let it grow and you leave it alone. And it'll emerge from the ground like in this picture. And then it'll get tall and it'll eventually fern out and leaf out. Um, you will always get, by the way, or at least everyone I always knows, you'll get some female plants in there. It's not a big deal. Uh, and even in this picture, you see that there are berries in the left. Um, just over time, statistically, they'll just produce fewer spears, but it's not, it's just, it's a numbers game. It doesn't really matter. And it's a good job for kids. You can hire a little kid to, to pick all the berries. Uh, the first year, let them grow. Second year, you can pick a few. Um, and then the third year, you can pick a few, you can pick a little more and they'll start to sort of look thin and spindly after you pick too much. So then you got to let them go. Every year, you got to let some part of the plant live and make a big plant so that it can store energy for next year. Um, there's what a female plant looks like versus a male plant. You'll always buy them and they'll say it's 100% male plants, but you end up sometimes getting female plants. Again, not a big deal, but there's female berries on the left and male flowers on the right. That's what the crown looks like. 
And that's what a trench looks like. So you can see the bare root time is when it's cold. Usually it's December or, or January or whatever. Um, so there's snow on the ground, but asparagus is really super hardy. So I dug that trench. I would have buried just to the growing top part and let it start to get on its roots and then just keep filling in that trench. And then you can, again, in year three and beyond, you can expect asparagus beds to last, you know, ideally 15 years, 20 years. Mine gave up in, so they're very drought tolerant once established, but they do need water in a drought year. And mine, I was not diligent and I lost uh, asparagus beds in the drought of a couple years back. So um, otherwise not very fussy, not many problems. And that's perennials. Uh, you might also see horseradish when it's when it's perennial time at bare root season. Um, that's one where you just put it in the ground and it'll it'll get invasive if it has water, and otherwise it'll just keep to itself if it doesn't. So, I thank you for your time and attention. There's um, the, some resources that hopefully someone can post in the chat. The virtual resource page that I mentioned, pages, the IPM website, which is how to deal with pests and diseases. Call your local master gardeners or communicate with them via Facebook or other mechanisms. If, you, if you're in this county, we have a plant a row for the hungry effort, which allows you to take and share surplus with gardeners um, in that, uh, excuse me, with uh, folks that need um, fresh vegetables. So soup kitchens and, and um, food closets and so forth. Um, I, this a labor of love project is foodforestgarden.org, which I haven't updated in a while, but it's a multi-year project and, um, of integrating food plants into the native forest around here, uh, my property. So that might be of interest to you uh, to see what's going on in my garden. And I thank you for your time and attention. And um, Tracy, I don't know if there's words of closing, but. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Zach. What a wonderful presentation. Um, we've had lots of great comments in the chat thanking you for your knowledge and for um, your expertise today. So if you can, folks, just give me a thumbs up for Zach or a round of applause um, distantly. Thank you so much, Zach. In the chat, I've posted every link today. So to the Master Gardener website, to um, our uh, materials, uh, the, to the YouTube, and you can watch Zach's presentation as early as Tuesday of next week. So that would be the 8th. And we'll have that posted and so that you can share it with your friends or go back and rewatch. Um, what I'd like to do now is thank you all for coming. And for those that uh, would like to log off, go ahead and end meeting in the lower right hand corner of your screen. For those that are interested in staying on to get questions answered, Mary has curated your questions and we'll see uh, if Zach can answer some of those. I don't know that we'll get to every single one, but what we'll try to do is our best and we can answer via email um, some of the other questions. So with that said, Mary, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Very good. We've got a lot of questions, Zach, so I'm assuming what we'll do is just answer a few of them and then we'll post the answers with these, those from the first session uh, on the web page as we've said we would do. First question has to do with the heat wave coming up. It's supposed to be 110 degrees today in the San Gabriel Valley. Should I bring my potted seedlings in to keep them from getting fried? You might. Um, you might. I grew up in San Gabriel, uh, as it turns out. Um, uh, um, yeah, in, uh, so I, I often will move things into a dappled shade or a fully shaded environment, but uh, especially young seedlings. So right now is when we're seeding stuff. So I'm really actually worried about that. I uh, that are just having their seed leaves emerging. So if you if you can provide either shade in place or move things into shadier locations, it's probably not a bad idea. It the the thing about gardening, right, is that you invest. I do invest a, invest a lot emotionally in in this or that or the other plant. So uh, it's worth doing whatever you can. And sometimes you can't save them anyway because it's just too hot or the, or just too cold. But um, but I might look at, and you know, temporary shade structures can be anything from putting a, a chair uh, chair out next to a plant so that the shade sort of just falls on it in the, in the hottest part of midday to making structures with shade cloth to moving things in shade. So yeah, let, let's, all, let's all do what we can to uh, keep our plants alive in this coming heat. And the next question is, I'm mostly planting cold crops. Should I plant them in rows together or should I spread them out on the raised beds I have? Uh, I like to plant like with like only because because 
uh, and there's no there's no prohibition against mixing in beds. I just it's easier for me to figure out plant spacing when I know that all the broccoli, which is more or less going to be dinner plate size or bigger, uh, are all in the same kind of um, next to each other. Uh, and so there can be variations in in varieties of cold crops and other things. So the only the only reason would be, and if you know if you have experience growing them, there's no reason not to mix them. Um, but uh, I I guess they, unless the and then the other thing is if you're pulling up turnips or whatever and doing a bunch of soil um, disturbing, I might think about that. But um, I just tend to plant them together just because then I know that they're all going to be more or less the same size and I know how close to space them. Uh, the next question has to do, I believe, with the planting guide. I don't understand the circles around the dots. Uh, the circles around the dots are the best, like the ideal, uh, If I don't know where mine went, but they, I believe that they're the ideal, sort of this is the ideal seeding window, at least for Placerville. Um, but but that's just, that's a little bit, I wouldn't focus too much on that. Um, uh, the wherever this kind of seed part shows is is fine. Uh, what about chard or asparagus? Um, I believe that question refers to what was stated earlier about uh, planting cold crops. I wouldn't make I would mix chard with cold crops, but I wouldn't definitely not mix asparagus because asparagus is perennial and will be in the ground for a long time. So okay. then. You mentioned coffee grounds in the compost. The person stating this said, I had read that this was bad, so I stopped putting grounds in the compost bin. Any insight on this? I My compost bin is almost exclusively coffee grounds, um, and I've been doing it for years. So, so you'll hear a lot of things about, oh, it'll be too acid or whatever. And really the trick with compost is balancing, um, balancing greens and browns. And then there are certain things that just shouldn't go in unless you're doing super hot composting, so disease materials, et cetera. But soil has a tremendous buffering capability and will trend over time, organic soils will trend to be um, neutral to slightly acid in most cases. And so I have never had a problem with coffee grounds. Um, uh, that, and again, those are coming out of my coffee maker. I'm not getting five gallon buckets from Starbucks or whatever, but, um, but unless something has changed, I have been composting with coffee grounds for the last 20 years and I feel like it's fine. Now my compost, I have it in an open pile and then I use a finisher. So I have a, um, I screen it to a certain particle size. Sometimes I run it through a chipper shredder and then I finish it in a, in a tumbler. Um, but I, I wouldn't, um, the only thing it is, it clumps together, right? And it, and it gets, it can get really sort of anaerobic and wet if it sort of, it makes things kind of sticky. But if you have a good balance of greens and browns and you're turning it and making sure it's well integrated and well cooked before it goes in the beds, I've been doing it for 20 plus years and I don't intend to stop. <laughs> and also vermicompost or worm compost and coffee grounds are loved by the worms. Again, and the balance is the answer. Yeah, yep. Next question, what's the purpose of a cover crop? Are there cover crops that are more complementary than others? So a purpose of a cover crop is to, is to grow something in place that adds soil nutrition. So you grow it up and you, um, and you are typically using uh, uh, a legume or one or more legumes. So bell beans and field peas and vetch are kind of the classic one. And then you're using an annual grass, uh, like a rye, to just add uh, more or less roughage, right? And something for the, the vining stuff to climb upon. And I plant those in October, um, try to time them to the rains, and then they'll start to grow, then they'll stunt when it's, when it's winter, and then they'll, as soon as it's warm again, they'll shoot right up, and then you chop that up and till it back into the soil and wait three weeks, let's say, um, to, to, and then that will break down in the soil. And then you've just added compost without having to sort of move it around. It just happens in place. So it's a bit of a trick to time it. If, if, you, if you have limited growing area, it's kind of difficult because you have to you know, devote that time where some, something you would have otherwise been planting something in October in that bed, right? So I often have one bed or one area that's just not, that's not in production right now, so to speak, and it's just being cover cropped. And then I'll rotate that one around so that, um, and that's easier to do when you have a lot of, of space and a little less easy to do in a smaller space. But 
it's always a good, I mean, it's just, it's again, it's doing something good for your soil and putting it right back in, so. Okay. Next question, are green onions really just mature, immature onions, or are they a different thing altogether? They're a different thing altogether. Um, so onions, they're allium, sepa, and green, they're, but they don't tend to bulb, although there's, there's sort of, there's sort of some variation there. You can buy very small bulbing green onions, right? They sort of create a bulb, a small bulb on the bottom, but chives and green onions typically won't bulb at all. And they're just grown for the, the tops part. So you're looking for, for green onions, scallions, chives as the signal words when you're buying seeds, as opposed to, um, as opposed to kind of bulbing onions. That said, you can eat the tops of regular onions and you can eat garlic and other stuff, you know, you can eat the greens, but, um, but you're typically buying seeds specifically for green onions or chives or, or those kinds okay. of things. Uh, since you mentioned scallions, next questions, question is, are scallions difficult seeds to start? None of mine germinated. Um, I don't have that experience. Uh, onions tend to take a long time. In my, in my experience from seed, they tend to take a long time, which is why I really, I, I often will get, do them from six pack. Um, scallions specifically, I haven't had that problem, but it could be that, um, you know, the things that impact germination are the age of the seed. And then the conditions being the light, the temperature, the moisture, and the soil, right? And so, um, and so sometimes tweaking one or more of those variables can get you better success. Uh, older seeds will just germinate less. So look on your seed packet for um, the year they were packed. That doesn't mean you shouldn't, like I, I often find seed packets that are like a decade old and you, you plant them and what will happen is you might get a 50% germination rate where a year of fresh, a year in on fresh seeds, you might get an 80 or 90%. So, um, so I'd look at just manipulating any of those factors um, and then uh, that, that's where I'd go. Next one has to do with earwigs. Yeah, earwigs. So earwigs are gnarly little critters that love to get into tight spots. Um, so there's lots of, uh, so I would go to the, the UC IPM website and I would look up the treatment and control for earwigs. And, uh, and you'll find that there's, they're mostly mechanical techniques like taking some moist newspaper, rolling it up and putting it next to the plants. The earwigs choose to go in there to avoid the heat. And then they'll, you'll, you'll get a roll of newspaper, wet newspaper filled with earwigs and you can throw them in the trash or a bucket or whatever you wanna do. Um, there are other, you'll see other things about um, submerging, uh, taking a can of oil and those kind. there's a lot of kind of those mechanical trapping kind of uh, ways to deal with earwigs. But that's what I'd look at before I'd look at any, I, I don't use pesticide in my garden. And so I wouldn't look at anything there, but um, your mileage may vary, but there's, so I'd go, go to the IPM and that's what I would do for honestly any, any problem. I just go, what I go to look at the IPM recommendations for earwigs and, and or call the master gardener office. That's where I'd go. Always a good idea. Next question, if you grow some crops as microgreens, when you snip off the top, will they regrow new leaves? Very often they will, it just sort of depends. Um, and if you can't, if, and some of that depends on how much, if you cut off the growing end and they, they then fry or whatever because of the heat. Um, but, but a lot of times you can get something to, if you're snipping the whole top as a microgreen, it, it'll come back and sometimes it won't. And so, Sometimes you can let it go a little longer and just take the outside leaves, which are still small, but maybe not as micro as you like. You might have better success because you're leaving the kind of growing, the middle part, the growing tip, but it, it just sort of depends. And the next question also has to do with picking leaves. If, when picking leaves, such as a third of a plant, is it best to take the biggest or is it best to take from the bottom first? Bottom the outside ones, right? The older leaves, because the plant will put out its new growth sort of from the center like a fountain. And so the older, um, the older leaves are the ones that, that I would take. And they often, you know, they can be a little funky, like the older leaves always, they, they can get a little dried out or have holes in them, but you want to sort of take the outside, uh, the outside ones. Okay. Uh, do you recommend treating neem oil, treating with neem oil and soil? early to avoid pest problems? I would have, so he, I don't know the latest on neem oil. I don't do, the only thing I, the only applications of anything that I put in my garden relative to pests and diseases are insecticidal soap, um, diatomaceous earth, BT, 
and light horticultural oil for fruit trees. Um, and so I don't have experience. That's one where I would uh, either call the Master Gardener office or um, look at the, um, when you're using any, any sort of thing that you're applying to the garden, the, the most important thing is to just read the, just to read the package and make sure that um, you're applying it for the right reasons and at the right time. And especially when in the vegetable case that you are making sure that, that there's often a harvest thing, like you, for some things that you put on plants, you really don't want to harvest or eat those things until a week later or whatever. So the general kind of master gardener recommendation is know what you're trying to treat, and that's the IPM approach. And then when you're treating, just know that you're following the directions on the thing. So I, I don't have um, personal experience with neem, um, but I have experience with growing neem, but not with uh, using it as an insecticide. My soil has produced small mushrooms. I've been picking them up because I have animals and don't want them to eat them. The mushrooms start grayish, then grow taller, white with a cone cap. Should I be concerned? So uh, that's a good question. And actually there are um, a little bit of a bird walk, but there are mush wine caps and other things. We have some master gardeners that are experimenting with those at, with actually deliberately growing mushrooms as as mulch and other things and wine caps are some are one that can be can you can buy wine cap spawn and use it as a mulch and harvest the product of the thing so um, other than that I, I the, my only experience with mushroom is delib mushrooms is deliberately growing uh, easy to identify edibles and so I'm not uh, I'm not I don't have a recommendation for other than one thing that mushrooms might be indicative of is overwatering so, you know, mushrooms like moist um, conditions. And so, uh, but if that is not a problem that you're having, like I have mushrooms randomly pop up here and there. Um, and I don't worry about them from a gardening sense. The the, the pet and other things I, I don't have a recommendation for because I'm not equipped to answer that. Okay. Uh, next question, do you suggest planting lettuce, kale, collards and flats and then transplant or do you direct sell? Uh, yes, and really, yes, and it depends on if so. One of my problems is that my beds are at the time you would seed. Um, it can be it can be difficult for young baby tender plants to survive. You know, at this time of year, it's going to be 100 and whatever, uh, even in Georgetown. So that's a consideration. Um, if you're really on top of it with your watering and you're really out in your garden a lot, you know, that and and can really shepherd those baby plants through that tender period then go for it or provide shade for them with shade cloth or other things and if it's if it's a concern then i i almost always uh, plant most things in six packs because i just can control the variables more i can keep them in filtered shade until they're a little uh, less tender and a little bigger and able to handle like the brutal this is probably not the last brutal heat we're going to have right we'll have one more aberrant uh, super hot event in the next couple of weeks and so um, but but it's a yes and like i planted directly burdock turnips I planted a new kind of, look at this really quick. Um, I planted this, um, this bald head mustard. That's what it looks like. I've never planted this before. It's called Chinese bald head. And, uh, and so it's a mustard, but that makes sort of a turnip structure. I'm very excited about it. Um, but that one I direct seeded just because of the form. Like I wasn't sure, I didn't want this, this root part to start getting going in a six pack and disturb it. Um, so it depends in some cases on the plant and then your ability to just, manage the plants. Uh, I don't avoid it, but only when I can be sure that I'm going to be able to. The other thing is that, as I mentioned, my seedlings, if, in my greenhouse, I can control pests. And I don't want one of the, if I planted direct in the ground, my kale right now, one of those little fuzzy caterpillars is going to fall off the, the madrone tree right near my garden is going to eat every one of those. And I'll have to reseed like four times. And I don't, I can't find any row cover. So some of it's like just a super practical. Um, how, how can I get those plants to get on their roots and get going in the safest way possible. So. We're getting close to two hours into this presentation, Zach. Uh, oh, there's okay. A few questions that uh, I can send to you and have you answer, and then we'll post them. Yeah, let's. Uh... We're losing people. We're down. The last I checked, we had 200 and almost 20 people initially. We're down to 94, which includes five of us. So. Time to wrap it up, it sounds like.
Yeah. Mary, thank you for, and thank you to Tracy, Mary, and all, and Pam, and everybody uh, who was here to support. Uh, it's always, being a Master Gardener is great because there's so many supportive, wonderful people that um, that help make these events go. And uh, so thank you all for your time and attention. I wish you the best of success in your garden, and and please avail yourself of the re various resources in the chat and, and plug into the Master Gardener program. So, And visit the Sherwood Demonstration Garden and buy plants from us when we have a plant sale again. The SDG is the most beautiful gem. It's gonna be the greatest uh, uh, garden. It already is, but it's gonna be the greatest in the state. So it's just beautiful. We had some folks in the chat say they went, meant they went for the first time, so. Wonderful, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we so appreciate all of you for being here with us today and thanks Zach. Um, what I'd like to do now, I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting. And for those of my hosts, we'll do a quick wrap up. So check your email right now and I'll see you um, momentarily. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Bye, y'all. Bye.